Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar today uh, with, with Platform 9. The topic is Simplifying Kubernetes Monitoring with Prometheus. We'll just give about a minute for the people to join us here, uh, and then we'll get started shortly. Thank you for coming today. Hello, everyone. Once again, this is uh, Kamesh Pemaraju with uh, Platform 9. Uh, welcome to our webinar from Platform 9 today. Uh, the topic is uh, Simplifying Kubernetes Monitoring with Prometheus. Uh, welcome uh, wherever you are today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, today we're going to uh, talk about Prometheus uh, and other platform applications that are required to have a cloud-native application in production at the enterprise scale. So I'm joined here today with uh, with Eric Bannon. Uh, so uh, quick round of introductions. Uh, I'm Kamesh Pemaraju. I'll be uh, initially, and um, and Eric will be doing a detailed demo of Prometheus in action on Platform 9. So very quickly, um, I lead product marketing here at Platform 9. Uh, prior to joining Platform 9, I was with uh, you know, Adele and Marantis and ZeroStack, uh, with several years of product management and product marketing experience, delivering open source, private, and hybrid clouds, um, solutions to the enterprises and service providers. Eric is uh, our senior product manager, uh, speci specifically focused on Kubernetes and managed apps here at Platform 9. Eric brings a um, whole lot of experience in pre-sales engineering and leadership roles uh, working at Turbonomic, Mesosphere, and he has tremendous experience in IT infrastructure visualization, cloud containers, and IT operations. Welcome, Eric. Uh, look forward to uh, having this presentation with you today. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. With that, um, I guess let's get the jump straight into the uh, presentation today. Um, so let's start with uh, Kubernetes itself. Um, I'm assuming a lot of you are familiar with Kubernetes or are using Kubernetes at some um, level of um, usage within your, your companies. Uh, one of the things that uh, Kubernetes brings to the table, of course, is it's extremely popular. The project has taken off. It's only five years young. Uh, the community is very active. It's now one of the largest open source um, projects uh, out there. And um, people are using it uh, pretty extensively. Uh, as a matter of fact, in a recent uh, Gartner uh, paper, they said uh, in the next three years, Kubernetes adoption will be as much as 80% across the enterprise, which is a staggering number. That being said, um, implementing core Kubernetes uh, at operations, you know, at, uh, at a massive, uh, is a massive challenge uh, because of the following four issues, right? A, uh, you need to integrate it with your existing enterprise infrastructure and components. Uh, and in particular, if you're trying to do multi-cloud, you need to manage across several data centers, potentially, or, or public cloud environments. And that's not trivial. You, you, you have to do a lot of integration work to make that work. And of course, you're all familiar with uh, Kubernetes in terms of how fast it is moving, right? It's, uh, it's changing very quickly. It's, uh, it's maturing very fast which means that there will be a lot of new releases with new features and functions coming out. And, and of course, Kubernetes comes out every three months. Um, versions are coming out furiously and constantly, and uh, you have to keep up with that. So how do you upgrade? How do you manage it? So that's where we come into day two operations. And day two operations, uh, when we talk about it, we mean things like upgrades, um, you know, monitoring and alerting and troubleshooting. Things go wrong in production at scale, how do you manage all of that, and how do you make sure that your system is up and running with a certain guarantee for uptime? And that is uh, not a trivial problem, especially if you're running it at scale. Imagine you have multiple clusters and multiple data centers. How do you do that in a, in a way that, that reduces overhead and, and makes it seamless and easy to use? Uh, and that's a, that's a challenge that the open source community doesn't necessarily solve. They'll provide you with the project, the code. You can go download it from the upstream community. 
Uh, it may be easy for you to get it up and running. There are enough tools now, KOps and, uh, and so many other tools, which, which makes it easy for you to deploy Kubernetes maybe in a POC or, or a dev test environment. But once you, once you start putting critical applications and you want to scale it, that's when you run into issues. Now, all this is compounded by the fact that there isn't much talent available out there. Uh, Kubernetes experts are hard to find and hard to hire and retain. So these challenges is what we see all the time. Uh, and of course, uh, Eric has been in this, uh, in this Kubernetes space for, the, for several years now. Anything you want to add to that, uh, Eric? Yeah, sorry, I was finding the mute button. Um, and I would just add, I think the, the trade-off is, um, based on the challenges that you mentioned, you have a lot of opinionated distributions that offer kind of that, that ease of use in maybe one provider or on-premises or in AWS, EKS, AKS, and Azure, or GK, and Google. Um, but the trade-off there is kind of the freedom of choice um, and also leveraging this idea of, of really the open source community and leveraging some of the technologies in a, in a do-it-yourself way without having to deal with some of these, um, some of these challenges. So I think that's, that's the trade-off is you, you get locked into maybe one provider. Um, you can't port applications from one type of Kubernetes to the other. Uh, so all of that is, is avoided by solving some of yeah. these challenges. True. Um, and then, and then continuing ahead, I mean, just having core Kubernetes isn't sufficient. So we've been working with a number of large enterprise customers who, once they take core Kubernetes into production, um, I mean, obviously at a cloud-native scale, um, you, start, you start to uh, look at other solutions that are required at the application layer. So once you have a cloud-native application in production, you need app monitoring, which is where Prometheus comes in and which is the topic of today's webinar. We'll be delving more into the details of what that is. But in addition to monitoring, you also need to be able to you know, get all of your logs in a, in a consolidated fashion and being able to trace issues as they occur. Databases, of course, are a given. You, you know, whether you have a stateful application or a stateless application, you need to store data somewhere, especially for stateful and persistent data. Uh, you know, things like MySQL and, and, and so on, right? Uh, and, or, and or NoSQL databases. So how do you integrate that into, uh, into Kubernetes and how do you get that scaling along with your application is also an issue. Now, at distributed scale, very large scale, uh, you have to be able to search through your logs and you, be, you need to be able to look at your data and visualize it and see how it's all working. So it's not a trivial problem. Uh, now you need tools. Uh, you may have traditional tools that you probably have for monitoring, uh, which may or may not be suitable for the, um, the distributed scale of microservices that you may be deploying. So as a result of this, uh, a lot of tools are now emerging in the uh, CNCF community, right? So we were at uh, Barcelona KubeCon recently, and we did a survey of um, over 500 participants. And, we, and amongst the questions we asked them, we asked the question around what additional Kubernetes tools and services they're using uh, in addition to core Kubernetes. And they came back and they, sh you know, this is the result of that survey. Prometheus uh, turns out to be the most uh, popular or most used uh, tool for uh, application monitoring in the Kubernetes community with over 56% of the participants saying, that they're using it in production already, followed by these other Istio and, and tracing. Jaeger is one of the tools for that, and also EFK. But clearly, Prometheus is something that as soon as you have a, an application in production, developers need to be able to monitor it, make sure that you know, it's running with the right performance levels, it's able to scale, uh, and the ability to troubleshoot things if uh, you know, services are going awry or you have your application taking up too much CPU, et cetera, so clearly this is a big, big deal, and people are starting to put that into production uh, as is evidenced by this survey. And, um, but uh, the issue again, and we talked to these people and said, hey, um, what do you think and what, what kind of issues are you running into while you deploy these, these applications, and Prometheus in particular? And, and one of the biggest challenges that um, people identified, and we are seeing that within our customer base too, is the ability to manage the life cycle of that application. So each of these things, whether it's Istio or Prometheus or EFK, 
these are tools and software applications that that need to be managed over their life cycle. Uh, so everything from HA to scaling to backing and restoring, uh, even disaster recovery if you have distributed sites, uh, et cetera. And that is not a trivial issue. Uh, and you need to have the skills to do that. You need to be able to figure out troubleshoot things if they go wrong. Uh, and we've had customers and uh, you know that have deployed um, Prometheus, for example, hundreds of instances. And Eric, I know you've been working with uh, some of our customers and you've seen very large deployments. What challenges have you seen with uh, what people are trying to do with Prometheus today? Yeah, it's, um, so, so it's interesting. I think, um, I think that the first challenge that was solved by Prometheus was around operations teams and using things like Node Exporter, being able to actually monitor cluster operations and different um, types of operations-based use cases. As Kubernetes has uh, evolved, I think what we've seen is in enterprises and very large ones, they're being tasked with delivering um, and managing Prometheus instances for different lines of businesses, different development groups. Uh, in this case, one of our customers was managing 400 instances uh, of Prometheus in terms of the backend infrastructure, how those things are deployed, how it's configured, role-based access. Um, and developers are beginning to use this more in an application monitoring uh, framework, meaning um, operations teams don't want to have to worry about how to instrument the application, how to expose that to Prometheus, and developers don't want to have to worry about the underlying components of how they actually keep that healthy. Um, now, there's one thing I want to mention here is the, you know, the first thought that the audience is probably thinking is, well, why doesn't operators uh, solve this problem? Uh, the, the answer is no, because operators are very, very good at the application specific logic, uh, meaning it knows how to instruct the application on what to do from a very, very narrow perspective in terms of where that's running, um, how it is going to scale and back up to that specific application. But when you look at the broader use case uh, with DevOps, tying these multi-layered applications across operators, um, actually building these into, um, into enterprise use cases is very difficult. For example, just because I have an operator set up for Prometheus doesn't mean that I don't have to tie that into how I actually instrument and monitor uh, my stateful data or my databases that might be involved in that application. Uh, just because I have an operator for Istio doesn't mean that I don't need to focus on traffic shaping and how I actually uh, do blue-green updates or, or, or different things at the, at the layer of the user perspective. So um, the operators are very, very promising. We, we leverage the operator lifecycle management framework. So what you're going to see is that we've built, um, we've built a lot of these managed apps on top of that. But what's missing from the operator community is really the cohesion of, of tying this together um, from a use case perspective on how people are actually going to use this in the real world and how they're actually going mm -hmm. to be, uh, begin to do some of these things, right? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. Um, you know, the, the operator framework is something uh, that we have leveraged, as Eric pointed out, and you will see that in the demo um, after the presentation here. Um, so just quickly, I wanted to touch upon how Platform 9 is solving this, uh, going back to what we were just saying. Uh, so solving the, the, the Kubernetes operations and skills issue is something that we have been doing for the past several years. Uh, we have our unique SaaS-based delivery model, which looks like a SaaS application from a user and admin perspective. Uh, and behind the scenes, we have our SaaS automation, if you will, or web scale automation that we apply and, and we are able to do things like automated remote monitoring and healing, uh, remote upgrades. Uh, when we have new versions of Kubernetes that, that come out, we do all of the uh, wedding and testing behind the scenes. And when it's ready to go, we just say, here it is, and you know, you click a button and everything gets upgraded. Uh, same thing with security patching. We are part of a um, special interest group, uh, security special interest group, uh, and our certified Kubernetes admins uh, have access to what's happening out there in terms of security vulnerabilities that are popping up. And, and then we are now able to take those security vulnerabilities, uh, test them beforehand, 
and then using our SaaS delivery model, push it out to our customers seamlessly. So that's part of the value add. Uh, and we can do that across any infrastructure. So this is the, the key, right? You can go to a public cloud, but then as Eric pointed out earlier, you are kind of stuck into their ecosystem of APIs and their infrastructure. Uh, on the other hand, with Platform 9, you can bring your own infrastructure, your own data center, or if you have existing accounts set on AWS, Azure, or Google, you can bring them too. And you have one single upstream version of Kubernetes you can deploy across all of those clouds and get that unique SLA-based uh, managed experience. So we've been doing this for a while now with Kubernetes. We've had some uh, pretty good success with some very large customers. And we have uh, production clusters, um, hundreds of them out there. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the problem now is, now that Kubernetes is running, what about all of these other applications? And so our vision uh, is now to move to these other applications and make them quote unquote SaaS managed as well. So we can provide that differentiated developer experience. Now, what you see here is a whole bunch of platform apps that you would need in any production cloud native environment. Prometheus, EFK, Istio, Jaeger for tracing, MySQL, and then you need your CI CD tooling, uh, Spinnaker, Jenkins X, you know, JFrog, and any number of uh, tools that are out there. Um, so how do you get those um, into your environment and, and, and so on? So this is something that we are starting to move up the stack and help customers uh, consume those applications without having to worry about managing it. So that's kind of the, the real uh, value that we bring to the table. Now, what is the benefit of all of this? Of course, you know, the idea is that single click experience. We already have hundreds of open source applications in our app catalog, which are all hemp based. They are community applications. So Prometheus and all the related Prometheus um, helm charts are already in the app catalog. And you can deploy them today. They're open source, of course. There's no support or managed, um, managed uh, experience behind them. But if that's how you want to get started, you can certainly do that. Um, but the idea is you need to have this entire lifecycle experience, right? So we're extending that same ease of use and single click experience. Now we are uh, adding this managed apps catalog. And this is where you'll start to see things like Prometheus and Istio and MySQL and AFK, et cetera. And again, from a development perspective, you have a single click experience of deploying Kubernetes uh, and also associate applications like Prometheus. And you'll see this in the demo shortly and what that experience looks like. And the idea here is you don't have to worry about the SLA for the underlying core Kubernetes or any of these applications you know, at, at, a, at an SLA layer, right? So we manage the uptime, we manage the upgrades, the entire life cycle of that particular application or applications, and you just consume it like a public cloud. So what are the uh, benefits of this, right? So the benefits of this come, come down to essentially um, having that fully managed experience and not having to worry about the operational complexity. So everything from guaranteeing uptime, um, round the clock monitoring and healing of the application, ensuring high availability, ensuring that it performs uh, at scale, uh, and ensuring that the, all the integrations you have in place are working correctly, uh, diagnostics, alerting and troubleshooting is part of the, the service, and upgra upgrades, of course. And there, is, there will be security issues at the app layer as well. So if there are security patching that needs to be done, we will take care of that as well. So uh, anything you want to add to that, Eric, in terms of the, the overall managed experience and, uh, and what we're doing, and in particular for Prometheus? Yeah, I think, um, I think the, an easy way to think about it is we're making the consumption of operators easy. So from the perspective of operations, um, when you look at Prometheus, there's a lot of different components <clears throat> that you need to deploy from keep state metrics to node exporter to configuring the CRD um, resources for service monitors for the Prometheus instance for Prometheus roles, alert manager. So specific to this, the, the goal would be to abstract all of that complexity away as step one. That's, that's kind of the, um, the first step in solving the problem is make the consumption of the operator easy, make the management of that, the integrity of the operator uh, SAS managed so that we can take care of that, the heavy lifting as it comes to the developments there. Um, and the second step is going, and what we're gonna show in the demo is making the consumption of that from a developer perspective 
um, basically uh, a simple UI, a simple way to do it where they don't even have to know what really is running it underneath uh, in terms of it being uh, Platform 9 or the operator. So as far as they're concerned, they're getting the full Prometheus stack deployed within minutes, and all that's tied back to the benefits of what the individual operator is doing. Uh, but operations is able to deliver that in a production-ready way where they can manage this across multiple clouds, multiple clusters, multiple development groups, and, and actually get visibility into this at a 30,000-foot view uh, across the entire ecosystem. Um, so that's, that's an easy way to think about it going into the demo. Right. Excellent. And that leads me to the next slide, uh, which is around enabling effective collaboration between development and operations teams, right? So this is the premise of DevOps. Uh, in order for you to have an effective collaboration. If you look at what developers want, uh, at the end of the day, they, they, they want self-service. They want API access. They want easy deployment of applications, um, single-click experience. Uh, they don't want to have to deal with ticket-based um, service requests, things like that. Um, and they want the native uh, KubeCuttle and API experience. So they are able to automate their, uh, uh, their, their pipelines or they want to automate their app monitoring or what have you and do so in a way uh, that is seamless, automated, and fast, right? Because at the end of the day, developer productivity and getting applications to market is what they care about. On the other hand, if you look at what operations people are looking to do is to support those developers so they, they get out of their hair uh, in a way that, that is still they have still control and governance over what's being used, how much is being used, um, and not having to deal with all the operational complexity and burden or skills to learn each new application. Now, Prometheus itself has its own APIs, its own way of configuring using YAML and its own Helm starts, and you don't need to deal with all of that as an operator. Um, and, and at the same time, operations is all about governance, right? You, you want to be able to control access, uh, you want to be able to manage your capacity, you want to have some level of centralized visibility for management and governance, and ideally you want some sort of a UI kind of experience, an enterprise consumer type um, you know, UI which is easy to use, uh, because some of these folks come from uh, you know, traditional operations background, VMware admins or storage admins, and these folks uh, are used to that ease of use UI experience from VMware or Microsoft or what have you. And, um, and that's what they're looking for. So how do we bridge these two together, give what each team needs so they are very productive, and as a whole, the DevOps collaboration and the business objectives are met seamlessly. So that's the, that's the whole idea, and that's exactly what we're going to show in the, in the demo that's coming up. So uh, very quickly, um, and Eric will kind of jump into the details of it, but there are really three steps. Uh, ops people want to enable Prometheus deployment across any Kubernetes cluster running on any infrastructure. And, and as I said earlier, the ability of uh, running upstream Kubernetes on AWS, Google, bare metal, VMware is a key um, uh, you know, business requirement for many enterprises. They want to be able to write an app that's interoperable in a multi-cloud world, and they want to be able to monitor it using Prometheus. Now, imagine having multiple clusters spread across environments. From an ops perspective, that's a nightmare because now you don't have visibility, you don't have control, you don't have governance. So the idea is that enable those Prometheus instances, provide the appropriate uh, type of uh, role-based access control so you know who is able to access it, what they're able to do with it. And at that point, you give full self-service back to the developers. Now, developers are 100% uh, full self-service. They can deploy any number of Prometheus instances they want with a click of a button uh, for any number of applications that they want to monitor, configure advanced alerting rules, um, and configure the severity of those rules, and you know, make their application better, faster, cheaper. So that's really what their goal is. And then finally, uh, from an, again, from an ops perspective, they need to have full visibility of where Prometheus is running across all of their clusters. So they have full visibility of Prometheus instances running across all clusters, how much CPU they're using, how much memory they're using, which namespaces they're running in, et cetera. So that's what you're going to see um, in the demo uh, that um, Eric is going to show. 
Well, by the way, if you have questions, you can uh, you can start using that uh, tab on the right where you can send questions to us at this point. Uh, we will monitor those questions tab and we will get to answer as many questions as we can towards the end of the demo. Thank you. I'm going to hand it back to Eric uh, now who's going to run through the actual demo. This is a live environment that we have set up and uh, Eric already has some Kubernetes clusters running in various clouds. So back to you, Eric, for the demo. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, screen share. Uh, let me know. Uh, are you able to see the screen okay, Kamash? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, so what you're what you guys are looking at is the the management plane for Platform Nine. So this this management plane is hosted on our private cloud uh, internally. The control plane for each of the Kubernetes environments is going to be uh, wherever you run these environments. So you can see here I have four different environments running. I've got um, an environment in Azure. I've got an environment in AWS. I've got two local uh, data centers running bare metal um, for Kubernetes. And um, this is also accessible over the API. In fact, most of our customers <clears throat> um, regularly tie this into a Terraform provider, the Ansible provider to provision clusters, tear them down, um, auto scaling, all those different functionalities are provided out of the box. Um, now, the key here is that we're not leveraging EKS, we're not leveraging AKS, we're not leveraging any opinionated distribution. Uh, this is pure upstream Kubernetes. So when you look at this, all of these environments are being provisioned um, on the resources for each of these clouds, but are being configured in a very specialized way based on your requirements for security, networking, all those different things. You're able to use the, and consume from those clouds without having to tie yourself to a specific distribution. This is also what allows us to do remote monitoring and SaaS-based monitoring because now we can actually offer an SLA with uh, the host agents that we have installed. Um, oops, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Uh, my watch was going off, apologies. Um, so you can actually monitor these things remotely and offer an SLA um, on each of these environments. So what you're looking at um, is four different environments. In my application catalog, I have various deployed applications that I've deployed from my Jenkins pipelines to Kafka, which is actually what we're going to be showing uh, under the monitoring today. And the first step that happens is, let's say I want to go into one of these environments and enable the ability of a developer to self-service this and access this functionality. So by default, they aren't going to have access to the Prometheus monitoring uh, capability, an admin must, has to come in and actually enable this for the cluster. And so what this actually does is, well, let me just uh, export my kubeconfig to this so you can see that now I'm in this Azure environment, I can view the nodes, um, and I'll just do a quick, I'll watch the pods uh, so we can show you what actually gets deployed. When we enable this, this is basically doing a, a few different things. First, it is uh, deploying node exporter. It's deploying the Prometheus operators, um, our own managed operators for managing this. It's deploying cube state metrics. It's also going to uh, go out and begin to build these in their own namespaces. Um, and what basically the first step is let's deploy all of these different components that are necessary for uh, the Prometheus environment uh, in order to actually um, begin to run these things. So it should start kicking off in a minute. Um, you'll begin to see things getting created. So um, all these So Eric, components. This, is the, uh, this is the administrator um, enabling Prometheus for specific cluster, right? That's what's going on Correct. here. Yeah, okay. So uh, the administrator says, I'm going to enable Prometheus for an AWS cluster or a, or an Azure or a local cluster. And then a lot of magic happens behind the scenes. And that's, that's what this is showing right now. Correct. Yep. 
so you can begin to see, um, so node exporter get, gets deployed as the daemon set on all the nodes. Um, now we should be able to see the custom resource definitions that are deployed as well on the environment. So now you'll see the CRDs for the alert managers, um, the Prometheus instances, the rules, and the service monitors. So it sets that up entirely from the get-go. Uh, so you don't have to uh, worry about deploying that or being an expert in the operators. Um, the next step is, so role-based access, if you wanted to set this up beforehand, uh, it's not really a hard problem to solve, but we have um, the idea of, of managing multiple clusters, multiple clouds is, is a hard thing to do uh, if you're creating a, a bunch of YAML lines of code for roles. So what, what one of the things that is nice about this is you can actually go ahead and configure, uh, and that's just because I clicked a cluster that isn't there. Um, you could configure a role, let's say, for, we'll say, CICD, Kafka, and let's say I want to deploy this to multiple namespaces simultaneously. Um, I can assign the same role to go out and create those roles in each of those namespaces. Um, this is pulling directly from the upstream APIs, so I can select all the different um, APIs that I want, and same for cluster roles as well. So if I wanted to go out and assign uh, multiple cluster roles to multiple clusters at once. I can do that. I can have full access to um, creating fine grain controls for this if I wanted to. Um, the next step is if we actually go to the Prometheus monitoring um, UI, this is going through several updates. It's currently in beta um, right now as of 3.11, targeting GA within the, the next several weeks. Um, so you can see immediately from an operations perspective, I've already got several um, Prometheus instances deployed in various namespaces. I could view these resources. I can look at the existing rules that I have in place, um, what they are. I can view the different service monitors, uh, and so on, um, and manage this from a operations perspective if I have the cluster all to view all of these instances. Uh, let's go ahead and let's create a new Prometheus instance. So let's say I'm a developer. I would come in. I wouldn't see Team B's things, I wouldn't see uh, Team C's things. Assuming I've, I'm set up to access to my namespace, I'm set up with all the different permissions I need in operations, I would only be able to provision this within my focus of control. So I'll just call this uh, DevOps Team, team A. Um, we can assign a number of replicas um, that we want to use. So I'll do four in this case the memory and CPU, um, the cluster that we want to deploy to, in this case, it's going to be on Azure. I'll pick my development web apps role that I created, uh, a default service account, the storage retention, um, as well as any types of uh, app monitors for the service monitoring CRD that I want. So I can add all of these at the click of a button. Um, and now we can go ahead and let's configure a Prometheus rule. So let's say I want to go ahead and notify based on CPU. I'll just call the CPU warning medium. Make the severity uh, warning. Make the period five minutes. Add the rule. Complete. And now that will go ahead and deploy that instance. Um, in terms of accessing this now, we expose it over um, a service. So now this service uh, that we deployed, in, the, in this case, I'll, I'll show one that I've actually configured to monitor the, the Kafka environment. So in terms of um, looking at the Prometheus UI itself, um, that will get exposed over a service, over either a load balancer or however that cloud is configured uh, to, to expose that. And hey, Eric. Now, go ahead. Uh, we have a question from the audience about how the metrics are scraped and how, how you're connecting them to Kubernetes. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, so the metrics will get uh, scraped based on the service monitor labels that are deployed. So if you deploy, um, it's a good question, so sorry, I might have skipped past that. If you deploy the service monitors for the Prometheus operator, it's going to be looking for um, any pod or any deployment, any type of Kubernetes object that has that label in its metadata as a selector. So the second I deploy 
an application or something that's exposing Prometheus metrics with the key value pair of that service monitor, Prometheus and the operator knows to immediately begin scraping it for all of the metrics. So we underneath we're using cube state metrics, we're using node exporter if you were doing to do this on nodes, etc. Um, in the case of something like Kafka, uh, you, the application team would have to expose like a JMX exporter. Uh, the application would actually obviously have to um, be ready to expose Prometheus um, metrics. Uh, so a simple a simple way to do that um, is um, if you look at like uh, any type of Kafka configuration. There's many examples of this in the community, but if you did, um, I'll just do the CV, uh, JMX exporter. So in this case. I've just I've deployed a service for as a Kafka exporter and um, sending that to the Prometheus port over a uh, uh, over this over this separate port from the actual web service itself or this the Java application. Um, so there's some documentation on that that we can share, but um, in terms of the application itself, it would it would need to expose those metrics to be monitored. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Yep. Um, so now, in this case, um, I have uh, I've also deployed Grafana. Um, so now that th you'll see that uh, as that service is exposed over this port, um, Prometheus is beginning to scrape that because it has the um, it has the label selectors and it also has the target port to scrape the metrics from on those endpoints. So these are each of my Kafka brokers. And it's beginning to scrape those metrics over the target port that I've exposed to the JMX exporter. Now, uh, in terms of visualizing this, what I've done is we've uh, we've deployed Grafana in this environment, and we've added uh, Prometheus as a data source. This is going to be automatic, so we are going uh, right now. Uh, Grafana doesn't populate automatically as the UI endpoint. Prometheus. UI populates by default. Um, when this goes GA, Grafana will happen automatically. And you can add the data source to this. So um, obviously, if I were um, looking at my data sources, all I've done is I've actually just added the endpoint for Prometheus, which is what you're viewing here. Um, so I've just added that, which is exposed over AWS, a service type load balancer. Um, and then it's begun to pull in those metrics for me, and I've created several uh, queries where I'm me measuring the heap size versus the garbage collection, the uh, message count uh, per second, and uh, versus my network throughput on the Kafka brokers, um, how I'm scaling the brokers themselves, whatever we look at. Um, and if you also look at some of these um, some of these um, in Prometheus itself, you're actually able to um, run any number of metrics from the Kafka exporter that's exposing these. So if I wanted to look at, um, let's say, server producer queue size, I can execute this and it will uh, return those values. Uh, Grafana makes this relatively nice because it actually visualizes those in the dashboard and, and runs those queries uh, for you automatically. Um, so going back to this now, we one of the key things here, um, so as we mentioned, we have a customer that's managing about 400 instances of Prometheus. Um, it's very, very difficult to, to monitor performance, to monitor and troubleshoot anything that goes wrong with these instances. To be, to be on top of that many development groups at scale is, is very challenging. And one of the things that you will get with the managed apps experience is we actually run scale testing on the operators. We actually are putting them through the ringer. We are, we've done this for Prometheus where uh, we measure how many metrics and, and how often it can pull these things on how many objects before it falls down. And we are beginning to actually formulate that into um, remote recommendations, suggestions, ways that we can actually extend the SLA, similar to if a worker node goes down or um, the Docker daemon isn't loading on a, on a node, where our remote team is already monitoring things in the infrastructure on the cluster level, automatically generating tickets, preempting that, troubleshooting it, and bringing it back up for you from a SaaS-based approach. 
we want to extend that to these types of use cases for performance, for uptime, for actually being able to scale and, and do some testing on these operators that are being released in the community. And as a result, um, we want to pick the best in class operators that are being put out there uh, that are being used by our customers. And we want to make them consumable. We want to make them easy. We want to make them um, point click from an operations perspective and also from a development perspective. Um, obviously, we start getting into some of the nuances of the question that the gentleman asked where how do we actually expose metrics from an application perspective? Um, it's a great question, and it depends on the application. It depends if it's Nginx, if it's um, a Java web app, if it's Tomcat, whatever. It depends on what you're going to monitor. But the point is, that's all you're, you have to worry about uh, versus <laughs> worrying about that in, in correlation with how you deploy Prometheus, how you configure it, how you scale it, how you make it perform. Um, we want to take that off the table as step one. And step two is going to be, okay, now how do we make it very easy to configure out-of-the-box rules, out-of-the-box alerts, and exporters for the applications? How do we begin solving that problem into the application arena so that um, we're really putting this together end-to-end -to -end and, and solving the bigger picture? But um, as far as right now, a lot of technologies take the approach of um, doing like a single Prometheus instance per cluster, maybe using something like Cortex, to do multi-tenancy, uh, that, that's all well and good, but um, it also puts operations in the way of having to be in charge of all these different aspects to that multi-tenancy um, in terms of governance, in terms of, you know, Joe doesn't have access to Tom's stuff and vice versa. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't afford the flexibility and the agility for these development teams who in some cases might want Prometheus to be up in a staging environment for two weeks and that might be their use for it, and they don't need to, and they don't want to deploy it again, right? So um, we want to solve a broader set of use cases, I think, with this, and that's that's what you're beginning to see is the self-service consumption model where we're targeting it from both angles. Yeah. Any comments? Hey, Eric. Um, yeah, that's great. I think um, you've covered the the gamut of uh, what's what's happening behind the scenes and what the benefit is for end users, uh, operations people, and developers alike, which is fantastic. Um, so I think it's time for us to kind of open it up for questions. Um, so I'm already seeing, uh, before we sort of jump into the questions, I just wanted to end with this kind of a vision slide uh, from Platform 9. As you can see here, uh, customers, the way we work is we let the customers bring their own infrastructure. You can bring your own environments, whether they are public or private. Uh, your public cloud accounts, your bare metal environments, your KVM nodes, or your VMware environments, you bring them, uh, and then we kind of sit on top of it. You know, whether it is uh, infrastructure stacks and orchestration like Kubernetes, and we also have OpenStack, managed OpenStack, as uh, another offering we have. And then now we are launching these managed uh, platform applications, which is what you see in this chart, which is all managed by us with full, fully managed white gloves, 99.9 percent .9 SLA, and then we allow choice, as Eric was saying earlier every customer that we work with has their own tooling, right? Whether it's databases uh, or CI3D tooling, Jenkins, NoSQL, or data services, uh, Kafka, Spark, et cetera. We allow them to bring their own tools, put them into the app catalog, deploy them easily with a single click. We don't manage them at currently those that, at that layer, um, but we want to allow choice so our customers are able to do that on their own. And of course, at the top is your revenue generating application whether you're into IoT, AI, big data, mobile apps, we're able to um, uh, help you with getting those apps out to market quickly. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to the audience for the Q&A session. Uh, Eric, I think this question is for you. Uh, hi, on the metric scraping part, uh, I have a question. If my application is talking to internal services like a database service, and we want to measure DB calls performance from a Kubernetes application point of view. How do we do that with Prometheus? How, to, how does Prometheus capture and build a dashboard, for example? Yeah, so it's a, so it's a great question. Um, if it's, uh, so it depends, uh, I'm guessing it would be a stateless web application that's 
um, talking to, let's say, like a, a SQL database or MySQL database, um, what you would need to do is you would need to um, obviously expose the metrics to a Prometheus port on the job application itself. If it was, in this case, I'm just assuming it's Tomcat or something like that. Um, and those metrics that you expose would be uh, would be part of what's actually getting uh, part of uh, what Tomcat exposes to Prometheus. So you'd probably have, um, I'm not sure the exact name for the metric, but I know it's there, um, where it would be measuring some of those um, some of those components. So then from a database perspective, you could do the same thing. But um, in terms of Prometheus, yeah, you would have to, <clears throat> you'd have to set it up in a way where it's um, specifically built in the application to uh, obviously talk to that database. And then once you expose that from the web application's perspective, um, in terms of the request it's getting or what, whatever metric you want to capture, um, from both angles, then you could create a dashboard that captures it both from the web front end in terms of the requests coming in, as well as uh, how those requests are getting um, getting positioned back to the database. Um, yeah. So, it's not, so you're, I, referring I know to, that, uh, you're referring to a Grafana dashboard, correct? C correct. Yeah. If you if you were going to build a dashboard, uh, Prometheus Prometheus is good for exposing the metrics and allowing you to to run um prom promql queries which is a whole nother mm -hmm. conversation um uh so it allows you to query it uh grafana is where you would configure these queries to um let's say um you wanted to create a panel where you're adding a query and you would add that as um like in our example before, I think we did CPU total per second um, or whatever the PromQL query is, and that will begin to present that in a time series um, in a time series manner in, inside Grafana. So you you'd use some visualization like Grafana to do more of the dashboarding for this. Got it. Got it. Keep those question uh, questions coming, folks. I have a few more questions here. Uh, the next question is. Uh, what version of Prometheus do you support, and how do you handle the different versions between Kubernetes and Prometheus as they uh, as they get released? Uh, so it's a great that's a great question. So um, so the operator handles most of that automatically. So basically, if you're looking at the um, I'm not sure of the exact version, but we're running one uh, one thirteen dot six. On these um, on this environment, uh, so you'll see we're currently running the latest release for 1.13, uh, and whatever is packaged as the OLM um, for, from the operator um, on that version would be what is what is used um, during the deployment of that operator. Got it. Got it. Great. Uh, thanks for that. Keep those questions coming. Uh, there's another sort of looks like a more fundamental question. Question: uh, the, the question is asking, why do I need Prometheus specifically uh, for managing or monitoring Kubernetes applications? Why cannot I use one of my existing monitoring systems, Datadog um, and, and things like that? So you, you absolutely can. Um, I think that <laughs> most of the time, um, you know, look, you're you're going to be using things like App Dynamic, uh, New Relic, or different types of things that you're monitoring from an application perspective. Um, Datadog is also a good solution. I mean, if you don't want to have to worry about uh, configuring things, um, obviously you're paying money for that. Um, so, the the idea here is to really bring an open source experience, right? Um, a lot of the reasons people pick a monitoring solution that they pay for um, is because they don't. Um, th th this problem is challenging to solve using the open source community. Um, obviously, the same goes for Kubernetes. So, from that from that perspective, I think that um, looking at it from a Kubernetes perspective is different than your application monitoring tools. So, looking at um, how the containers are consuming resources, how the actual application is making requests. Uh, to the gentleman's point about uh, the database calls. 
um, how it's uh, going and getting its persistence, what the latency is, uh, all from a Kubernetes perspective. Those are those are use cases that are solved kind of from the top down from Prometheus, and that's where we see customers using it the most. Is they don't want to pay for an enterprise monitoring solution, they do want to leverage uh, the flexibility of Prometheus as it's open source, but they also want to be able to view it from a, um, a pure Kubernetes play and not just um, from the application's point of view. Got it, got it. Okay, keep those questions coming. Uh, here's another one uh, that is specifically around what are you doing about other applications? You mentioned Istio and um, EFK and others. Is it the same model that you're following or what, uh, what, what's happening there? I love that question. So, so yeah, the, the use cases will follow the same theme of making the operators easy to consume and making it self-service. So those themes will stay true. Um, but in terms of the use cases and how that's presented, presented for consumption, it's going to be different across each application. So, for example, what we're doing for uh, EFK is we want to enable that um, uh, basically the same thing for Fluentd in terms of the operator. Uh, we want to allow you to target um, any remote Elastic URL. Uh, we partner with Elastic on L2 support for this as well with our NOC. So there's the aspect of partnering with um, someone like Elastic who actually has a support team, whereas Prometheus doesn't really have um, maybe a particular partner or vendor that's doing that. And then uh, the key there is uh, we, we have a lot of customers with EFK complaining about um, just the sheer heaviness of it and and how logs are forwarded to Elastic and what the retention is and what the intervals are and, and how they how they keep that highly available how they um, how they access that in a performant way. Uh, so for EFK, it would probably be solving the problem of. Um, of actually, I don't think managing the logs is the problem, but managing the interaction between Fluentd and Elastic, how those logs get forwarded, how they get stored, how they get accessed, um, and doing that at scale. Um, it would be more probably an operations use case for, for that specifically. Um, we'd also probably want to tackle the application use case there, but I think number one yeah. would be solving that for operations. Um, then your second reference was for Istio. There's two big use cases we see for Istio. One is around um, blue-green uh, upgrades for applications, so developers who maybe have a microservice or set of microservices where they want to do live testing, they want to only deploy the part of the microservice for that development team that's going to be changing and they want to use service mesh to basically tie that to maybe a live running application that's in production and, and actually beginning to do some pretty advanced things around um, pretty scaled blue green upgrade types of use cases where you're not having to deploy every part of that microservice um, by itself. And when you're really only upgrading parts of that in that in that code change, um, the other one is traffic shaping. So shaping traffic, throttling traffic based on the service mesh, uh, making it easy to set up. So making it easy to set up um, the service mesh, the gateways, the different things that you want to configure uh, for which services are going to be tied to that service mesh. Uh, obviously, a lot of that's handled by the linker DUI, SDO UI uh, itself, but in, in the context of Kubernetes and some of those use cases, it, it's, a, it's a relatively new question. So we're doing a lot of um, R&D into that, specifically for Istio, because the honest truth is not many people have it deployed in production. Um, and the right. ones that do um, are having a pretty difficult time, I think, managing um, how traffic shaping occurs and how how they actually find a, a real use case for Istio that, that gives them a win versus some of the things that are coming later, I think, which are things like multi-cloud and running an application across two different clouds. I, I don't think the ecosystem's quite there yet. I think what we see is people are mostly targeting some of those low-hanging fruit type of use cases. 
Hope yeah. that'll... We have about five minutes left. Um, I, I see a couple more questions. We'll, we'll, we'll answer them if, um, you know, we'll answer those two. And as other questions, we'll try and get back to you after the session. Uh, so the next question, Eric, is around whatever you showed today on the metrics configuration and, and setting up the instances, are, there, are those all available to be done through an API? Uh, and if so, is that the kubectl API, or how do we how do we automate some of those things? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So, um, so the management plane, the UI that you saw, also has an API to it. Um, we have a cluster lifecycle management API called Kubert, uh, and that's what interacts with from the management plane to the control plane um, to the Kubernetes API server. So everything that you saw, yes, it is available in the API. You would just uh, you would just push that through um, either a REST call or directly to the API through Ansible or through whatever scripts you want to use uh, to call on that. And uh, we have full API documentation on how to do that. So it would just be doing the same thing the UI is doing, except configuring that in a um, in an API call to basically go and execute, and it would go and deploy all the same things you saw on the cluster. Got it, got it. A follow-up question to that. Um, as, as we automate some of this using the APIs, and if there's a new uh, Prometheus version and you're upgrading it, is there a downtime associated with that upgrade? No, so there, should, there shouldn't be, and this is where um, this is where we work hand-in-hand -hand with the operator community. Um, so the operator, again, is intended to solve that problem. Um, now, how well it does or doesn't solve that is still um, a little up in the air. Uh, as far as we see it right now, uh, it does a r pretty good job of, of handling that um, from, from the perspective of what it sees. And what we will be doing around that is, is really testing that and putting that through, I think, more rigorous testing um, and contributing that back to the, the open source community in the form of enhancing the operator. So there's, there's two ways of looking at it. One is the management experience and the functionality we're providing, but also we don't want to be redundant. Uh, we're not trying to solve the things that the operator will solve because that's already being solved, right? So um, yeah. the, the goal would be that that's solved by the operator community. Uh, and the operator would handle that for the version of Prometheus. Uh, insofar as it doesn't, we would probably consider act, um, adding things that would make that a little bit more smooth. Hopefully Excellent. that answers it. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, we have just a couple more minutes. Some more questions are coming through. Uh, I, we would were, we were definitely answer those since we are running out of time here. Uh, but in the meantime, if you wanted to follow up with us, there's your contact information on the screen, info at platform com. Feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. And a recording of this uh, webinar will be available on brighttalk.com, so you can go back anytime and take a look at that. Um, and of course, you can learn more about Manus Kubernetes from Platform 9 at that link uh, that you're seeing there. Uh, and um, I really appreciate the time that uh, you, you all have put in today. I uh, appreciate the time, and thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Hopefully, this was a useful session. And um, you know, you're always um, welcome to come back and view the recording and or send us any further questions. Uh, we thank you so much for attending today. Have a great day ahead of you. Take care. Bye-bye.